You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club, a home for those interested in international trade, shipping, procurement, logistics, and air freight. In fact, all things supply chain in the Americas, Asia, and beyond. This podcast is brought to you by your host, Mike King, and produced in partnership with Demurco Express Group, a global 3PL that specializes in managing logistics to, from, and within the Asia Pacific region. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Freight Buyers Club, which, as you've just heard, is produced with the support of Demerco Express Group. I'm Mike King, and you can find this episode and many more on all podcast platforms and on YouTube, along with a bunch of shorter video interviews and news insights. You can also find all this content on www.thefreightbuyersclub.com, where you can subscribe to receive every episode direct to your inbox. Now, let's get started. Trade and supply chains are facing multiple headwinds, from the economy to heightened geopolitical risk, from more regulations to China's slow recovery, and today we'll be covering all these topics. But where else can we start as we speak at the end of the first week of January, but the Middle East? Houthi rebels based in Yemen are continuing to bomb ships in the Red Sea around Bab al-Mandeb, the strait which is essentially the gateway to the Red Sea and Suez Canal. Depending on which analysts you listen to, somewhere between 10 and 20% of global container shipping capacity is now being rerouted or rerouted for our American listeners via the Cape of Good Hope, adding weeks onto transit times to Europe from Asia and significantly lengthening transit to the US East Coast. Now, not all ships are being diverted and the, and the situation is really fluid. But we know from the ever given blockage of the Suez Canal during the COVID pandemic that disruption around this region can quickly have big knock-on impacts on supply chains. To discuss this and much more, I'm delighted to be joined by two experts in their field. John Gold, VP for Supply Chain and Customs Policy at the National Retail Federation. Welcome once more to the Freight Buyers Club. Thanks, Mike. Good to be back again. And appearing for the first time, it's Mark Zaccone, Executive Editor at the Journal of Commerce. A happy new year to you, Mark. Happy new year. Thanks for having me. Mark, as you uh, you heard there from my meandering setup, it's pretty torrid start to the year for international trade and logistics. How big a threat to global supply chains are you viewing current event in the Middle East at the Journal of Commerce? I would, you know, I would say it's modest. I mean, we're definitely seeing prices rise on the spot rate thanks to you know higher FAKs and surcharges both on Asia, Europe, and the Trans Pacific. There's been some delays in, in shipments for sure, and obviously the, that's changing how shippers are having to have the inventory. But, you know, all goods were in stock for Christmas and the winter holidays. So to a degree, it's being managed. I think what's different about this with Ever Given is that there's no sense of when this ends. And then also the sense of how does it end? You know, you you remove the ship from the canal and things proceed. Okay, very binary. Now we've got a, a patrols and there's a sense of some folks are comfortable with it, some are not. Like there's no on and off switch when all of a sudden I believe that shipping is going to be like, wow, the situation in the Red Sea is back to what it was in early 2023. And I think that's really what I guess is interesting and a bit scary about this. As you as you mentioned there, we've had some big rates movements, particularly on that Far East to the Med and Far East to Northern Europe container trade. But we've also seen spot rates climbing around 40% in the last week of December and again around about 30% according to Drury first week of January into the US West Coast. What's your view on on what's causing that? Surely it's too early for, for ships to be delayed on that particular routing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think you may be getting a little bit of the early restocking because we've got an early Chinese New Year celebration in early February. We, we really have a hard time of grasping the extent of blank sailings, the total capacity, because the, the frequency of blanks is, is coming with shorter and shorter notice. So it's hard to capture, particularly, say, through sea intelligence data. And, you know, I think there's a, a certain degree of some carriers are able to go back to the shippers and say, hey, listen, we're taking extra costs here, and that's pushing up rates. I think what's really we're going to see in the next couple of weeks is the extent of which some of these next wave of surcharges really are accepted in the market. And I think you're going to see a lot of interesting conversations between reps and shippers on just what is the fair cost given what's going on. 
I think for, for European shippers, obviously that trade, there's a far larger proportion of shippers will be on the spot market than say on the Trans-Pacific and the contracting period is a different time, turn of the year on Asia Europe. On the Trans-Pacific, it, it's April, May, sometimes even into to June, but a much smaller proportion of that overall traffic is actually spot traffic. Would that be the case for most of your, your retailer members, John? I think most of my members are still on contract rate. I think, you know, to Mark's point, they are having conversations with the carriers who are trying to push through some of these new charges and, and fees and rate increases. I think retailers, you know, and other shippers understand the longer times lead to additional costs, but I think retailers make sure that the costs are, are justifiable, that they're reasonable costs. So I think there's going to be a lot of pushback initially on some of these significantly increased charges and rates. I think there's got to be shared value here between the retailers, the shippers, and the carriers. I know a lot of my members are, because of what's in the contract, they're having those conversations. I think a lot of folks expected lower rates this year, lower transportation costs, as we've seen over the past post-pandemic. But you've got these unforeseen issues that continue to impact the supply chain. I, you know, Mike, when we talked a year ago, nobody had this on the agenda for what was going to be the next supply chain disruption. And to, to Mark's point, who knows how long this goes? And I think many carriers right now are saying it's just not feasible, it's not safe to transit the Red Sea and the Suez, um, especially with the, the increased attacks we've seen over the past couple of days on, was it Maersk and MSC? Both have had recent attacks, both by air and sea, drones as well as small boats. So you've got some new issues that are impacting folks. And, you know, where Maersk had initially said they were going to try and transit the, the Red Sea, now they're saying they're holding up. They're not going to do that now. There's a lot of uncertainty, additional risk, and volatility right now in the network. And again, it's unclear how long this is going to last. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I have no subject matter expertise in this issue, but my hunch is that ultimately it's going to be the rate of insurance that determines what, what the routing. The insurance costs or the war surcharge costs. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's, it's going to be a calculation of risk and additional cost. Yeah, well, there's those fuel costs, there's the Suez Canal costs, of course. There's a whole bunch of costs. But uh, John, you made a very good point there. A year, we spoke a year ago, the world's a very different place now. But I was thinking, actually, what well, I approached you about this interview about maybe a month ago. I mean, how different is it even in that much shorter time frame? I hadn't imagined then that we'd be looking at rising rates as one of the, the trends on the agenda because vessel supply was outpacing demand by some distance. And we also have, you know, we've got all these deliveries coming in as well. But of course, with these diversions via the Cape, this has all been ripped up. Our retailers also ripping up their freight procurement strategies and supply chain plans on mass right now. And, and how are they taking these unexpected higher costs in their stride? I mean, presumably they could do without them or, or maybe another point, they'll have to pass them on, won't they? This is feeding into the inflation, or, you know, the, the enemy of choice at the moment. I mean, I think a, a couple of things. First and foremost, nobody's ripping up their procurement plans. I think what they're doing now is shifting to their you know, mitigation strategies, which certainly have been front and center for quite a while now. You know, look at what happened during COVID and now we're into this. So those plans are constantly being updated. I think right now, folks are trying to adjust to make sure they've got the product arriving on time. Everybody's now is pushing up their deliveries pre-Lunar New Year as opposed to post-Lunar New Year to make sure they've got the merchandise that's supposed to be here when it's supposed to be here. Obviously, many of the retailers are kind of at the whim of the carriers on diversions. You know, the retailers don't have any say as far as which way the vessels go. It's up to the carrier to determine which way they're going to go. But I, again, I think many are having those conversations with the carriers, especially on the costs and surcharges. And again, under contract, they're having those discussions and some may accept, some may not. I think the last thing you know, a retailer wants to do at any point in time is pass along costs to the consumer. So I think depending upon the retailer, they've got their strategies on how to adjust and deal with some of those costs. But again, it, it's this unknown of how long this is going to occur. And then it's the kind of the ripple effect downstream. The longer this goes, what's the impact then? If you've got carriers and vessels that are out of position, does that impact again kind of post lunar year, getting everything back and getting shipments flowing once again? What's the impact on the, the U.S. infrastructure with the diversion, if you're going to see a significant ramp up in diversions to the West Coast, are the ports ready? Are the rail lines ready? Are the terminals ready? Is that conversation happening now to avoid disruption issues? Uh, that's certainly one of the things that we continue to push now is making sure stakeholders are talking to each other to know what's happening with diversions, how much cargo is now going to flow to the West Coast, and are they prepared so we don't get into congestion issues, which lead to additional costs and delays.
Yeah, we're already seeing a, a pickup in transloading activity out of Southern California. Yep. So, um, yeah, it's it's changing things. I quote Donald Rumsfeld. I mean, the, the tangible intangibles, there's quite a lot out there, and this will unfold as time goes on. But let's look at one of those near-term domino effects, if I may. Lionel Lithica says the impact of the diversions around the Cape will impact slots available for departures from Asia starting from week four of 2024 onwards with significant drops in Asia, Europe and Asia, US, east capacity of up to 30% on certain weeks. That's getting very close, that week four period, to final loadings ahead of Chinese New Year factory shutdowns in February. It's not really the ideal time to have your cargo rolled, uh, to say the least. I'm hearing myself that lines are telling people to pay premiums for guaranteed shipments, and it, it really doesn't bode well for shippers. What are you hearing out there in the market from your sources, Mark? Are these schedule changes storing up trouble down the line for shippers, for the U.S. logistics system itself? I haven't heard that. I'd, I'm curious, where did Liner Tech come to that? How did they come to that conclusion? Well, I haven't been back and been through their report with them, but I okay. could do. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm curious of what they're measuring to forecast that disconnect. Because when we look at it on the equipment side, if we look at kind of the import-export imbalance, things are pretty good on the Asia loading ports. And on the port performance metrics across the coast, on West Coast, are, are quite good. So, I mean, there's supple capacity. I think, as John noted, the, the big question is, are the rest of the players in line? And in a lot of these cases, it's the rail car management that really causes a disconnect that pushes the upstream pressure back to the terminal. I think the reference there from Line Analytica is particularly those vessels that are going to take longer to get to Europe. They're going to be rushing back to Asia. Will they have time to pick up the empties and get the empties back to Asia? Will the vessels get back in time if they have to add another load, a bunch of weeks of extra transit times to get back to Asia, to get in place, to reroute? And I guess on the West Coast, you could propose that some ships might actually get moved over onto Asia, Europe. We saw all these things happening in the pandemic in search of higher profits, depending on where those spot rates go. You know, the lines are quite partial to seeking out a profit center. Um, <laughs> but we'll see how that, that plays out. John, you mentioned Chinese New Year. How are retailers set at the moment as, as we're looking forward to this Chinese New Year cutoff point in February. Are, are people going to be starting to worry about getting those inventories in if this disruption continues? Yeah, I think going back to you know, my earlier comment, retailers now are obviously putting into, into play their, their mitigation strategies. And part of that is accepting earlier shipments from their, their vendors. So making sure that product is here when it's supposed to be here. Obviously, you're looking at spring merchandise coming in now, Valentine's, stuff like that. So retailers are doing everything they can. And I think that helps with the diversions, whether you're going around the Cape of Good Hope or going direct to the West Coast instead. So, you know, retailers are certainly trying to make sure they've got product here when it needs to be. So it, it's, again, it's going back to the playbook of we've got a disruption. What do we do to make sure we've got the inventory on hand? I mean, the good thing coming out of the, the holiday season is that retailers aren't stuck with the excess inventory that we saw during COVID. I think retailers got through and, and are now back to, pre-pandemic kind of inventory levels. So they're not going to have that excess like they saw. But again, now the focus is getting the product here that needs to be here for the next selling season. Uh, of course, the ongoing crisis around the, the Suez Canal line and Red Sea shipping lane isn't the only negative out there, even uh, without venturing into the war in Europe and the chaos that's causing in the Black Sea. We've also had El Nino drought in the Americas. This has been a particular factor for the Panama Canal, where capacity has been curtailed due to low water. We did have some rain in December, which is a big positive. Things have eased slightly, but we're now in the traditional dry season. Mark, what's the latest on the Panama Canal? Well, you know, before Christmas, they announced that they eased up on the number of transits. From a container side, I think it's still a pretty modest impact. Again, the thing to remember is that most of these carriers have scheduled slots, so they're not fighting with the bulkers and the tankers for a limited amount of slots, whether it's Panamax or Neo Panamax. The other thing, too, is that, yes, they're having draft restrictions that is hurting their capacity, and I think that has given them a little bit of momentum to try to push some rates for East Coast routings. But it's been a pretty modest impact, and I would say, like, at most, you're probably adding maybe a one or two day you may get an extra day of delays at the canal, but I think the bigger issue is that this is not going away. 
that's the realization. You know, I, I saw the Bloomberg report and we had a story about it actually about a month and a half ago from a, a familiar friend of ours, Keith Wallace, basically, you know, talking to the Port Authority and they're saying, hey, it's going to be a couple years and we still need well over $2 billion to make this happen. So unless you believe that the rainfall is going to dramatically change and the water basin is going to somehow heal itself, it's going to take time. Another great story from Mr. Wallace. Well done, Keith. Some of those ships scheduled to transit Panama to the U.S. East Coast had actually been rerouted via Suez Canal only for that route to then be attacked. So it's all a bit of a perfect storm for global trade. But while it's a nightmare for ocean carrier network planners, it's going to be uh, great for their bottom lines of, of some of those carriers and, and possibly for the middlemen, the 3PLs, the forwarders, the brokers. Does this leave shippers as the only losers here if this continues? Mark, John, fire away. I mean, I certainly hope not. I think, look, as Mark noted, on the, the Panama Canal, I mean, we're not seeing too much of an impact from my members' perspectives. They really haven't seen it. I think they're planning appropriately. But again, this is where you've got to have that shared interest. Again, it's not just going to be the shipper who pays for this. I think shippers are going to continue to push back, especially as they see any additional fees and charges that are unreasonable. And certainly we've got the Federal Maritime Commission who's paying very close attention to this. They put out their statement a couple of weeks ago saying some of these are reasonable, but they're going to pay close attention, especially after everything we saw during COVID. They're on top of it. So certainly if we start to see some of this, they will certainly hear from shippers across the board who are concerned about being gouged for some of these issues. You know, on that point, I'm glad you brought that up, John, because we saw, you know, I think it was two days ago, we had a column, guest column by Peter Friedman of AgTC encouraging the, the Federal Maritime Commission to use this as an opportunity to look at how they provide transparency on some of these additional surcharges. Because as of now, it's more of a checking the box of did you file it? And, and granted, there's a lot of big issues there in the sense that the, the FMC, again, does not regulate rates. But I, I know Chairman Maffei has raised questions during the, the height of the port congestion of just how are these fees being accessed? Where are they getting this number? And and, when, and I thought what was really interesting, his point is like, when do they come off? So at what point does the industry say, hey, port congestion, it's in yellow, it's not in red anymore. So here come the sure charges off. And I think part of that is that doesn't have the same crunch in our industry because of the flexibility. Like these are worked out between commercial parties. No, absolutely. And it's unfortunately, it's it depends upon the shipper and the relationship with the carrier as well, how that all works out. If I may pivot slightly from those very good points, it, it feels to me like we're only just out of the pandemic. And just as we were expecting shippers to slip back into lowest cost thinking, all of a sudden, maybe resilience, supply chain resilience is, is back on the agenda. Do you, either of you think this will encourage some of the concerns about lengthy supply chains that became heightened during the pandemic to sort of rise back to the surface. I'm thinking China plus one, friend shoring, you know where I'm going with this. Yeah, I think, Mike, first and foremost, I think many retailers, shippers and others have gotten away from just focus on low cost. I mean, that's been for a while now. The whole diversification effort started well before the pandemic. Much of it started with the trade war with China and the tariffs, where a lot of folks tried to shift away from China where they could. Some have been successful in moving their supply chains, some are not. I think folks are looking at any opportunity to diversify, whether it's China plus one, plus two, what have you. Many folks are looking at that. But it's not just the fact of the, the shipper or retailer shifting to find a new vendor, because that takes time to figure out. Make sure you've got a, a new vendor who, first and foremost, can meet your, your needs, can meet your you know, capacity, quality, has the right workforce, has a skilled workforce. There's infrastructure available in the country. Do they have the right sailing schedule? All that stuff comes into play. And it's just, it, it takes time to develop that. But there are challenges with, with doing that. And I think, you know, especially if this administration was focusing on getting folks out of China, they've got to provide some carrots and not just sticks to people to, to be able to do that. So looking at having actually a positive trade agenda that gives folks incentives to move. Reauthorizing programs like the Generalized System of Preferences or the Miscellaneous Trade Bill actually having free trade agreements that include tariff reduction and market access. Those are the kinds of things that are going to help folks to, to move their supply chains. And having rules of the road that actually meet 21st century global supply chains, not rely on old trade agreements that don't really meet what we need for today. So I think folks continue to look for opportunities to diversify. And obviously, 
the China issue is a huge issue that everybody continues to look at, especially looking at Taiwan and issues like that and, you know, what's coming down the pike. So folks want to make sure they are, you know, moving what they can, but it's not easy to do. It takes time, unfortunately. And you've got to work throughout the supply chain to, to kind of make that happen. But again, that resilience and diversification is and has been front and center for quite a while. So I want to kind of get away from the notion that folks are only looking at low cost for their supply chains now. Yeah, I mean, Mike, to your question, you know, the way I kind of look at it, and I, again, this is just, I wrote about it for my column, so it's kind of fresh in my mind, is we're moving into a an economic sense, even given the continued North American strength of slower economic growth, right? And we know that uh, GDP is no longer a barometer of global container volume growth. And we also know that we're going to probably be in this kind of tight inflationary environment for quite a while. So that's going to keep carrying costs high, and it's going to keep companies very lean. At the same time, if you look at like the global supply chain on a container side, there's been a change in external factors. I think you can confidently say that there is far more geopolitical risk than there was 25 years ago. You could also say there is far more risk tied to climate change than there was 25 years ago. And then more recently, you could say to a degree, we're seeing a stronger, sharper, organized labor in the West. And, you know, I think, Mike, to one of your points that we had talked about before is you're also seeing greater destabilization. So there's a pullback on democratization, which is creating more authoritarian governments. And often those authoritarian governments aren't able to respond as well as, say, democratic governments can. So there's a, I mean, there, the landscape is completely changed, but at the same time, I would, and John, push back on this if I'm wrong, the demand to keep costs down despite all of this is probably even sharper than it was a couple years ago. I mean, look, there's always a focus on costs, especially coming out of the pandemic where you saw costs skyrocket that nobody had expected. So cost certainly is one factor that goes into all this, but it's not the only thing that people are looking at. I think, again, that resiliency is front and center because supply chains now are at the C-suite level and have been for quite a while. So folks want to ensure, one, you're getting the right product at the right cost, but make sure you actually get that product so that diversification is important. But again, cost is one component of the overall thought process when building out your supply chains. Thanks for that, guys. We'll just take a short break. We'll be back with you in a second. This podcast is proudly produced in partnership with DeMurco Express Group, a trusted provider of global shipping and contract logistics services in Asia, Europe, and North America. DeMurco's particular strength is in Asia, where it gives shippers the freight capacity and local market expertise to streamline freight movements to and from the region, particularly for trans-Pacific lanes. With 130 forwarding and logistics locations across China, India, and Southeast Asia, DeMurco connects Asia with the world like no other global 3PL. You are listening to the Freight Buyers Club. Welcome back, Mark. I want to come back to your geopolitical risk that you mentioned there in a bit more detail in a second, unpack that slightly. But just for both of you, someone used the word carrot and stick before. Um, in let me invert that slightly. Do you think China's providing maybe a bit too much stick and encouraging people to leave because it's not getting easier to get into China? When you go, uh, government advice infrequently is telling executives not to take their phone, maybe don't take your computer, use disposables. We're seeing executives being arrested. Is there a, an element of anti-Western feeling out in China, perhaps, or, or at least in terms of the policies that's discouraging investments and these longer supply chains in China? I mean, there's certainly a challenge with doing, doing business in China, but it's hard to ignore the, the second most populous nation in the world. So I think companies are looking to, to do what they can. We would love to see a much better relationship between China and the U.S. And, and others as well. I mean, look, there are a lot of trade issues with China right now on a whole variety of fronts, whether it's dealing with forced labor, anti-competitive issues, you know, what have you. And those issues need to, need to be worked out. But we can't do it as a U.S. alone strategy. We've got to work with our other trading partners who all share those same concerns. But it's a challenge. But it's a market that I don't think you can totally ignore, unfortunately. Yeah. Importantly, a lot of those Chinese companies that saw their business shift have set up in Vietnam and so on. So it's to a degree, I mean, this has been part of China's plan already. So there's as long as they're moving upstream or, you know, higher machinery, they're OK. They still have control of it, even if it's in another country. 
Yeah, as you say, that's very understated, that trend. I mean, you see that in India, you see it in Indonesia, you see it in Mexico as well. Just back to your geopolitical point, Mark, because we've got a lot going on in 2024. Uh, I quote Michael Every, who's, who's appeared on a few of my podcasts. He's a global strategist at Rabu Bank, and he's calling 2024 a global contest between democracy and autocracy as countries that account for half the world's population go to the polls. Even Russia is voting, although there's a, a strong suspicion, says cynical me, that Vladimir Putin might win another jaw-dropping uh, majority. But can I ask you what your view is of this contest through the lens of the future of globalization and reshoring and, and China plus one? And, and let me throw a few things out there. We've got all this geopolitical risk right now that you mentioned over Taiwan. Well, they vote in Taiwan on January the 13th amid these rising tensions between China and the U.S., Later in the year, we've got elections in Indonesia and India, both attractive options for companies seeking alternatives to China, but both coming under a bit of criticism for what is viewed as a diminishing of democratic principles in, in, in Indonesia, in a country I've lived in for many years. For example, we have the, the son of current president, uh, Joko Widodo, popularly known as Jokowi. His son is a running mate of his current defense minister, who hopes to be the next president. It feels like nepotism at best, at worst, an effort to maybe establish a political dynasty. In India, as you both know, Mahendra Modi's nationalism, authoritarianism, been getting a lot more negative attention from the West. He's, he's expected to win a third term there this year. Then, of course, we have the big one, US elections. Um, there's a lot of moving parts here, I know, but what are you both expecting from politics or democracy in 2024 in terms of what it will tell us about the future of globalization or the future of trade? Because we hear this talk about value chains, as in shared value chains, and this friendshoring concept. Do you think there's a link between the health of democracy and the health of globalization and international rules and laws that govern international trade? I would say in a short, yes. I would, and, and personally, I would like there to be. I would like the idea that democracies done correctly foster you know, fair and better trade, allowing countries to build on their advantages. I think it would take a, a a team of academics to find some kind of correlation between the two on that and container growth. But I would say you could probably make the argument that in terms of trade policy, a more democratic, active dem democracies are more open to trade. Although, you know, that's even the US, that's not generally always the case. So yeah, I, I, I think it's more the idea that we're, things are different than they were. And there is more instability is it the death of globalization? I mean, is the post-World War II consensus international rules-based system? Michael Every, for example, would argue that that's under threat, the UN institutions, that foundation, that facilitation of globalization. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're definitely weakened, but trade is continuing. And there's also, you know, you've, you mentioned this French shoring, that there's, there's cost to that. Like, there's a reason the, the big banks are warning that it's adding total cost. There's definitely inflation in the Inflation Act. It's you know it's it's kicked off a an arms race for green energy investment. John, any thoughts on the future of globalization? Just a small topic for you. Yeah. Just a tiny topic. I mean, look, globalization is not dead. Globalization is just it's changing for a variety of reasons that we've discussed today. But I think again, trade is good overall. I mean, it certainly helps nations to thrive and develop. Helps consumers. Helps workers. And I think that's something we need to continue to focus in on is that for too long, especially here in the U.S., there's too much focus on imports being a bad thing. And it's not. Imports help support millions and millions of jobs. I mean, especially in the retail industry, you know, we support one in four U.S. jobs, both directly and indirectly. A lot of those are tied to supply chains, whether it's investments here in the U.S., the, the marketing, creative, logistics, what have you. So global value chains are a good thing. They help countries to continue to develop. I mean, it's something we need to continue to remember. Whether you're shifting now away from China or elsewhere, you've got to help to develop those markets. We can't make everything here in the U.S. That's just impossible to do. So we can't onshore everything. And you can't Frenchshore everything. I mean, you've got to have that diversified supply chain because you just don't have the capacity globally to move everything to one country. So, you know, I think that needs to continue. I think we need to continue on, a, again, market opening opportunities, which help benefit both U.S. And, and our partner nation. But U.S. hasn't been doing that. I mean, we've backed away from things like any trade trade progressive programs. You know, we've got things like the, the IPEF and, and APEF that it's unclear what 
those are going to do at the end of the day. But TPP would have been a great opportunity had we continued to do that for some market opening and for some pushback against China and shoring up our other nations that we're looking to trade with. So I think if we want to have improved democracy around the world, we've got to figure out ways to continue to trade with our partners and help our allies. That's the only way to improve upon what we're going to be able to do. Mark mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act there actually driving inflation under one. It was one of the key policies of, of the Biden administration. We've got these U.S. elections coming up as it's festive season. What would uh, U.S. retailers uh, like for next Christmas from this uh, from this presidential race? What are the runners and riders got to offer you? Well, I, I want to go back first just on in terms of the the inflation. My point was more that you it's creating a, an environment where more countries are subsidizing. So that that is an overall general inflation. Um, Donald Trump has made it very clear on where he wants to take tariffs. Um, so I think the question is, you know, if that comes down, how does that trade, if he can get it through and he's elected, how does that trade change nearshoring flows and everything? I think we've seen a little bit more activity from the Biden administration in terms of probably being a little bit more forceful in, in port investment. Yeah. And then, you know, and then we've also seen a far more active FMC under the Biden administration. But yeah, for me, I think it's the more interesting thing is what would an election mean for the general mood of the economy? And I'm no expert again, but everything I read suggests that your mood depends on your political allegiance. And considering where the country is very split, half are going to wake up the next morning and be pretty optimistic about the economy and the others are, are going to be the opposite. Mark, what are the big freight or logistics issues from a JOC perspective in terms of those U.S. elections, you know, above and beyond the, the consumer sentiment? Is there anything else in there that you're looking at from an editorial perspective? We'll look at the extent of freight infrastructure investment. We'll look at, you know, if there's any changes in, in terms of new FMC chairman. It's hard. I mean, it's there's a delay in what happens in D.C., that actually comes and hits the average shipper and transportation provider. I think the the Port Ozra Reform Act was very unique in terms of its speed and also in terms of its actually having a ripple effect. John, less protectionism? I, we certainly hope so. But I mean, look, we're, what, 10 months away now from, from the election? Who knows what happens between now and then? And I mean, there's so much uncertainty right now. Who knows what the economy is going to look like in the next few months? Again, what happens with the ongoing wars that we're facing, whether it's what's happening with Ukraine and Russia or what's happening in the Middle East, that's all going to have an impact on what happens with the elections um, and the state of where the voter thinks they are and where the economy is. I mean, obviously, for the retail industry, we would love to see a more open trade agenda, a more positive trade agenda. Obviously, we don't want to see tariffs. We don't think the tariffs have worked for where they've been put in place. And as you know, Former President Trump talks about his ring around the country tariff, the 10% tariff, you know, ring around the collar is not a good thing. And I don't think our trading partners are going to enjoy that either. And they're going to look to push back on that. So it's unclear. I mean, obviously, we would love to see a more pro-business administration going forward on a variety of issues, not just trade, but labor and other issues as well, because those all have an impact. But, you know, it's too early to tell kind of what can happen and kind of where we're going to be in a few months. But there are certainly some things that we would like to see in a next administration, next Congress. There are things we want to see this Congress still continue to do, again, from a positive perspective on, on trade and, and infrastructure and things like that. But it's, I don't have a good crystal ball right now as to what's going to happen. I don't think anybody does. John, you remember that time we were on a panel in Memphis the day after? Oh my God. Win? Yes. And we yes. were, we had already, we were been like, you know, we're like, it, it, he could win. But most of our discussion was ready for a Clinton win. And yeah, that was an interesting morning. Yeah, because then we knew we, nobody knew what was going to happen. Nobody right. knew where, where Trump was going to go on anything that he had talked about. So I think we have a better idea going into a, you know, potentially going into a Trump too. I think there have been a lot of articles written about what the next administration is going to do, especially on trade. And it's not good from our perspective. So, you know, we'll kind of see. We're unfortunately this current administration is lacking on some issues on trade. I mean, we still don't have an understanding of clearly what the real China strategy is. We're waiting for the four-year report to come out from USTR on the China 301 tariffs. That's now a year and a half into the investigation that we thought was going to be out at the end of the year that we're still waiting on and no clue on when or if that's going to come out and what the future of those tariffs are. 
So uh, still a lot of uncertainty going forward. Okay, thanks for that, guys. To finish up, let's look at another domestic U.S. potential choke point in global trade. I spoke to the Wall Street Journal's Paul Berger about rising risk from labor disputes across supply chains in the U.S. before Christmas on this podcast. But the big risk from unions is really at, at ports. In 2023, this was the International Longshore and Warehouse Union casting a long shadow over performance at U.S. West Coast terminals for much of the year. That's, of course, now resolved, but in its place, we have a looming threat to productivity and reliability on the U.S. Eastern Gulf Coast. This is the International Longshoremen's Association, which represents over 70,000 dock workers on uh, the U.S. and Canadian East Coast. The ILA's current deal with port interests represented by the United States Maritime Alliance, USMX, runs out at the end of October. Union President Harold Daggett has threatened strikes this coming October if he doesn't get and I'll quote, a landmark compensation package for members. The ILA is also keen to push back on automation. Mark, how serious are you guys at JOC taking these threats from the ILA? I think they're serious. Anytime that uh, the ILA opens the door to a strike and it hasn't had a, a strike in 30 years, there has been a few wildcats and some stuff like that. But yeah, it's it's significant. Is it coming up in shipper conversations? Absolutely. I don't think the risk level, I don't think shippers see it in the same level of risk that they saw in the U.S. West Coast, not just because of the amount of volume coming through the U.S. West Coast, but just because of the history of the different unions in terms of how they worked out contracts. Uh, generally, the ILWU has been a little bit more aggressive and militant, and we've seen more kind of tactics such as slowdowns when things get tough, whereas that we've seen less of that, of course, on the East and Gulf Coast. But yeah, it's it's definitely being considered. And then, of course, not to be missed, we've also got a, a potential labor situation brewing up in Montreal. Their contract is expired and they're at a standstill in terms of negotiations. And, and you know, last year was marked by, I mean, we had the ILWU Canada too, striking in Vancouver and Prince Rupert. So... Yeah, there's lots of moving parts. As you mentioned, the the ILA has had a, a lot a lot better relationship with port interests than the ILWU over the last thirty odd years. We haven't we haven't really seen those sort of union friction. So were you quite surprised? But Daggett was quite with his choice of words. It was very very threatening compared to what we're used to from the ILA, isn't it? I mean, I think there there was a little bit. Maybe you could say the rhetoric was a little bit higher. But I mean that. Importantly, a lot of this rhetoric is he's saying it. We we sent uh, Michael Angel, who's our lead ILA reporter. He's gone to both of the conferences and conventions and spent days there. And a lot of that rhetoric is, is focused to the members. And a lot of it rhetoric is part of the negotiation process. I have not, nor have any of my colleagues gotten any sense from the carrier side that there's something extra rattling here. This is the language, and this is how the two sides usually kind of come together. The important thing is, as we've been reporting, is they're still negotiating. There's no sense that we'll get any of the go slows that you guys reported on the West Coast sort of last year. Anything's possible, and I'm not, you know, I'm a journalist, so I'm, I'm reading what I see and, and talking to folks, but that that is not the sense that I've gotten. John? But Mark, to your point, though, I mean, this, this saber rattling certainly is concerning for many of my members who don't want to get caught up in any kind of potential issue. So they're already planning now to shift back to the West Coast. I mean, look, the East Coast and Gulf Coast gained significantly over the past couple of years because of the ongoing challenges that the West Coast saw, whether it was through the congestion issues from COVID or the protracted labor negotiations that were ongoing and the slowdowns that we saw. So many retailers shifted to the East Coast and Gulf Coast. But now that that's a threat to them. You know, they want to make sure that they've got product that's coming in, especially because this contract expires at the end of September, which is right smack dab in the middle of the peak shipping season. And then make sure they get their holiday merchandise in. So as they have their upcoming discussions and negotiations with the carriers, this is going to be on the table for them to make sure that they've got the ability to get product here. So many of those, that ship might occur earlier than normal because, again, they want to make sure they've got the lanes set up and ready to go. So our message to both the ILA and USMX is get back to the table and negotiate. We were encouraged when the parties decided to start having early negotiations and there was talk of potentially a six-year extension. Everybody thought that was great. You know, let's have some stability, long-term stability at a port for once. 
And then things kind of broke down. Obviously, we saw the ongoing labor discussions last year, not just with the, the ILWU, but also with the Teamsters and UPS. And we saw with the rail lines. I mean, all that, we've seen more strident labor union negotiations that have been ongoing. And especially with this administration, who unfortunately is more favorable to the unions, they think that is a, is a benefit for them. And with this contract expiring you know, right before the election, I don't know. It's, it's going to be a challenge. We certainly hope that they can get back and, and have these negotiations. We know there are important issues on both sides, but they can't come to an agreement if they're not at the table. And right now, from what we understand, they're not at the table having, having discussions. John, what's the timeline on, on that potential shift or is that already happening? Because if you think that we've got problems into the East Coast via the Suez Canal, if you take that route, same with the Panama Canal into the East Coast, again, more likely to be problems there than there is into the West Coast. Everything's pointing towards shifting your cargo to the West Coast if you possibly can. Yeah, potentially. I mean, look, you've already got some of that shift happening because of what's happening in the Suez. I think as contract negotiations pick up, you know, in the next couple of months, you'll start seeing some more of that shift. Again, folks want to make sure they've got guaranteed space going into the peak shipping season later this year. So you'll start seeing some of the shift happening earlier than you would. Yeah, and to John's point, you know, I think it's definitely a concern. It's coming up in conversations. It's part of the thinking, but it's hard to discern how much of this is actually going to change behavior. And for us, what I think is going to be the best indicator is probably right around April, May, if you start looking at the import share of the coasts, by that time, most of the new service contracts will have been finalized and that cargo will have shifted accordingly to the new carriers. And you might start to get a sense of what the appetite of risk is. But then even then, there are so many other factors that go into that. Yeah, it, it's a murky business. It, it is complicated and complex and is only further complicated by all the other outstanding issues that impact the supply chain. And the other issue here is what's next? Nobody knows, but yet we know something always happens in the supply chain. And we've got to be prepared for that. Well, it's, look, it's looking healthy. Based on uh, National Retail Federation, the Global Port Tracker, we're going to see a nice lift of import volumes in the first quarter. So, I mean, yeah, the good thing that the port performance metrics um, on the West Coast are good. East Coast has plenty of capacity. But as John noted to our earlier talk of like, what exactly is the whiplash going to look like? Plenty to watch as 2024 progresses. Mark Zaccone, Executive Editor at the Journal of Commerce, and John Gold, Vice President for Supply Chain and Customs Policy at the National Retail Federation. Thanks for joining me today on the Freight Buyers Club. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Goodbye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Freight Buyers Club, produced in partnership with the DeMurco Express Group. Please subscribe and follow on your platform of choice or sign up for delivery to your inbox at thefreightbuyersclub.com. This podcast wouldn't have been possible without the fantastic editing of Karen Ball and Tom Matthews. And finally, thank you all for listening. The next episode will be with you soon.